Good morning. I'm Lynn Springfield, Director of Elementary Children's Ministries, and I'm so grateful that you're able to join us this morning for God's plan for growing up. So today, I am so delighted that Dr. Don Azevedo has been able to join us as our expert to help us <clears throat> in guiding us in communicating with our children. Dr. Azevedo is a clinical psychologist practicing marital and family therapy in Cary since 1992. He has led many church retreats for youth discussing sexuality, faith, and life. He has raised two children to adulthood with his wife Janice of over 30 years. And he is delighted to have an opportunity to begin the discussion of sexuality much earlier in a child's life with their best coaches and guides, their parents. Dr. Don Azevedo. Well, thank you for having me. Um, for fear of looking like a rock star, I'm going to carry this around because I prefer to move around uh, in the room. Um, this is a smaller group than I thought, so I'm actually going to ask you some questions before I begin. Like, what is it you would like to get out of today's session, and how old are your kids? So if we can go around the room, and I know we're not going to be able to get this on the video, but that's okay because I'm not going to ask everybody to walk up to the mic in a parade. But let's start over here, and we'll work around the room. Anything to add? Okay. Beautiful. So you're right. So this was, I did not plant him in the audience, <laughs> but the, the idea that he brings of help them to make really good decisions. The number one thing I want you to walk away from this conversation about is helping your child decide and learn how to decide, not just about sex, but about everything. So what, one of the things I'm going to encourage you to do as we go through this is offer them choices a lot of the time so that they have to think for themselves and make a choice and they get used to that and that they make more choices around school, around activities, around other things because the better they are at checking in with themselves and making a choice, the better armed they will be to make a choice around sexuality when they're older. And you wouldn't think that making a choice between a ham sandwich and a peanut butter and jelly sandwich would influence that, but it does. So we'll talk more about that in a minute. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank yes. Again, I didn't plant her. <laughs> But that's exactly where we're going at the end of all of this. This is really about how do you communicate to your children um, such that they are making the decisions for them, not feeling controlled by you, not feeling controlled by God, not feeling controlled by anyone, but knowing that this is coming from them. Because when kids feel controlled, they do the exact opposite. And that's an important thing for you to know. Right? Um, and, and I won't scare you with any of the thousands of stories that I have, uh, but I started when doing counseling at the Counseling Center at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, when I was in graduate school, working with 18 and 19 year olds who were making terrible mistakes coming out of the Bible Belt of, of Tennessee because they were free for once from over control. And so they made the opposite choice, and then they found out why that was a bad idea just a little too late. Um, so you really want the child to choose for themselves. That's the outcome of today's talk. I'd like to start the talk with a poem, if I might. This poem is called Children by Kahil Gibran. And a woman who held a babe against her bosom said, speak to us of children. And he said, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. You are the bows from which your children as living arrows are sent forth. The archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite, and he bends you with his might that his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness, 
For even as he loves the arrow that flies, so he loves also the bow that is stable. This is an important poem for me in my life because it really speaks to me of what it means to be a parent, what it means to have been given the life that, that, that was my son, Ben, and my daughter, Kim, and to have the responsibility for discovering them and helping them become the best children of God they can be because truly they're the children of God, not my children not our children. We were blessed to have them, yet they do not belong to us. They travel the path with us. We have the privilege of guiding them, but we do not own them. They own themselves. The spark of God is in them. It's not the spark of Don and Janice. It's the spark of God. And that's my job as a parent. To, to help that spark come to life and to burn brightly before other folks. So that's the context in which I'm going to talk about the rest of this stuff. You have a handout in front of you. Um, it, it has mostly questions that I would love for you to think about and discuss with your spouse. If you want to know how to talk to your children about sexuality, first practice with your spouse. Because that's what your kids are seeing. And how comfortable are you talking about sex with your spouse? Talking about how well it fits for you all. Where does it fit in your marriage? What was it like before kids? What happened after kids? You know, what happened after your kids start to turn into teenagers and you have more time? Where is it going? What is it changing like in your bodies? Because see, as your bodies are changing, and I, I, we're older than many of you in this room, <laughs> it, it has changed significantly since we were 20 something when we first got married um, to now. How comfortable are you talking about that with your spouse? Because if you have a hard time doing that with your spouse, you're gonna have a really hard time talking with your kid. And so is your spouse. This is another thing. Often in families, one parent takes the lead role in having this communication with kids, right? When we talk about communication as we're having the talk, do you remember the talk? <laughs> this is the one time event where for 30 minutes I'm going to tell you many uncomfortable things about your body and what happens and how children are made. And then I'll never speak about this again. <laughs> Perhaps you remember that one from your childhood. Or maybe you grew up and there never was a talk. I, there was no talk in my family. <laughs> I was the fourth of four children. <laughs> if, if they could get by not seeing me, that was a good thing <laughs> for them. <laughs> they were tired by the time I came along. I didn't help much. I was a handful, maybe two handfuls. Um, but so the beginning part is talking with your spouse. You know, what is our sex life like? And this is not talking to your spouse about what we're going to say to the kids. This is talking about you. So it gets really uncomfortable. Right? I mean, several of you probably got, unco who got uncomfortable and is willing to admit it when I said talk to your spouse about sex. Come on. Yep, there's two. Only two honest people in the room, right? <laughs> I would imagine that. Have this conversation tonight. See what happens. Because, see, your kids are already learning from you. They have been learning for up to, let's see, what was the oldest kid? 17 years? For 17 years, your children have been learning about sex from you and your spouse or from you if you're a single parent. They've learned about it from how you carry your body, how you interact with one another, the way that you look at one another, the way that you kiss in front of them, the way that you hug or don't hug in front of them, kiss or not kiss in front of them, the way you hold hands, how you walk together when the family goes out for a stroll. All of these things have been teaching your children about sex all of their lives. Because who are their primary teachers? You all are. So I would like for you to think about how affectionate have you been with your partner? You know, I'm, I'm not talking about, you know, throwing down on the kitchen table. Okay? <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about loving looks, you know, holding hands, paying attention when the other speaks, speaking respectfully, speaking with kindness, using normal social skills. So I've been doing this for 30 years. I've been doing marital therapy and family therapy for 30 years. Do you know how many couples come into my room 
And when I ask them, when was the last time you said please or thank you to your spouse? They cannot remember. <laughs> or when you said good morning or good evening, hello or goodbye. All of those things teach your children about sex. Because sex is not just the act of genitals coming in contact with one another, nor the procreation. Sex has to do with how you relate to someone in the most physical and intimate way, but that relationship backs all the way up to how you talk to them, to how you interact with them, to how you respect them. So those of you with boys in the room, right? The fathers, can you say, my children have always seen me treating my wife with respect, with honor, with dignity. Those are communications to your child about what it means to relate to women. Can the women say that they have stood up with strength and fierceness, you know, holding themselves as, as women with knowledge and intelligence and contribution in the world? Because let me tell you, your little girls are not seeing that in television and movies. They are not. They have to see it from you. And are you doing that? These are the communications about sex. You probably thought I was going to come in here and say, all right, this is how you say penis and vagina to your kid, right? And I can do that. That's fine. That's the nuts and bolts. You have a great book out there, well written. It's been updated, by the way. So my wife and I were laughing because we got a version of it. Um, that was published in 1984. Um, it was, and, and I was looking at this going, well, if they're going to use this, I have a lot that I need to tell them. <laughs> but no, it's been updated in 2015, so it has a lot of really great information in it well, about more the modern age. Um, so you're really looking at what is, my, what is my marriage, what is my relationship with people around me, it's not even just your spouse, that demonstrates love, commitment, respect, sensuality right? Um, and sex. So what's the number one thing for kids? Kids reach out inappropriately and confuse sex with sensuality all the time. Teenage kids need touch. Teenage kids are the ones we tend to hug the least. And they're very uncomfortable with the hugs. You know, young boys don't want to hug their moms anymore. Young girls don't want to hug their dads very much anymore. And, and can I share your story, Janice? She's going, she's oh my God, he knows so many stories. Which one is it going to be? So when, when Janice was a little girl, right, she used to wrestle with her father. And they had just a wonderful time. And she felt so close to him, and it was a wonderful thing. And then she hit puberty. And all of a sudden, he stopped wrestling. He never spoke with her about that. He never told her why he stopped wrestling. All she knew is that what was fun yesterday didn't exist today. Now, she got over that. And she married me. <laughs> That, those two things didn't actually go together. She did that first, and then she married me. But that's often what happens, right, is that all of a sudden, either the child or the adult gets less comfortable with touch. Well, kids are still craving touch. Even adults crave touch. One of the things that senior citizens ask for the most in nursing homes is to touch. And what do we give them? Therapy dogs. <laughs> right? We don't actually go in and hold their hands. We don't actually go in and hug them, right? And of course, HIPAA now has made that even more difficult because as a healthcare provider, I'm not allowed to do that. Um, even though that would probably be the healthiest thing for them. By the way, if you have questions, just come up to the mic and please interrupt me with a question. I forgot to say that at the beginning. Um, and with the mics and stuff, it's a little, uh, I, and if you don't want to come up to the mic, I'll just repeat your question. Okay. All right, so we've talked about communication beginning with you. That's what we started with. Uh, communication continues with your kids. Um, how have you been talking about body parts with your kids? That, that's kind of a question, but I don't need you to answer it really, unless you want to pop off an answer. But a lot, of, a lot of parents use cute terms and that kind of stuff, and there's nothing wrong with that, as long as you also teach the, the appropriate term for it or the medical term for it. Um, why is that? Well, because when you go to a serious c communication, you know, if you're talking about your PP or, you know, your private parts or that kind of stuff, it's not definitive enough. And it also suggests that I need a distance from...
really is. And when you have the more serious talk, particularly, um, this is true for boys, but it's particularly true for girls because you have to teach about health and um, all of the things that go along with menstruation and how that operates in the world. You want to be able to have those conversations with anatomically correct uh, communication without making it too clinical. So you want that to just be part of the vocabulary. Um, hence the need to use regular terms. It makes it easier when you have the more serious conversations. Um, and you need to be relaxed with it. That's why you practice with your spouse. Right? And I can't tell you how much that practice helps. Even try sitting around with a glass of wine, asking questions you imagine your kids would ask you, and practicing answering them all of a sudden. It can be a fun date night. Just think about that. <laughs> what did you guys do on your date night? Oh, well, we prepped for the sex questions from our kids. <laughs> it could turn into something interesting. How do you talk about body image? So we were talking about the Kardashians just a minute ago, right? And a very distorted sense of what is beauty and what is not. And you all are very aware that American culture right now has a very strange sense of what the appropriate women's body shape is, what the appropriate men's body shape is, um, what parts of your body you're supposed to grow hair on and what parts you're not supposed to grow hair on. <laughs> um, all kinds of these things are happening in the culture. And in the home, how do you talk about that? How do you manage weight? How do you manage your looks or your physique or any of those things? Again, how do you communicate to your children in nonverbal as well as verbal ways the fact that you love their mother or father regardless of body shape, that what you see is more than just the physical. Because our, our society puts huge eff emphasis in art, in movies, in TV, and um, the internet on the physical without understanding, connecting to the human that is behind that physique. What are we called to do in love and marriage? We are called to see the spark of God that lives in that other person, right? As, as a husband, I am called to see the spark of God in my wife and blow on it and see if I can help make it brighter and more beautiful. She is called to do the same with me, to lift me up. And that gets translated into our physical intimacy. That is what we teach our children. But that is not what culture shows them. So it's really important that you're demonstrating this, that you're present to this around your kids. Does this make sense? I actually want to pause here and see if there are any questions at this point. I can pause for a long time. I'm a psychologist, so <laughs> I would appreciate a question or a comment. Or an amen, I'm on track, or a, you know, you're a fool. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> I got an amen from this table over here. <laughs> Anyone else? Am I on track? Am I off of what you're? Yes, ma'am. I guess, you know, just this may be a segue to where you want Yes. <laughs> Come make a segue. Oh, okay. I'll repeat it for you. Yes. So the question is, is do I bring this up with my kids or do I let them bring it up with me? And my answer was yes, because it's a both and. So if we're watching a movie together, one, one of the things that we did with our kids growing up is we, we would have um, Friday night um, Chinese movie night. So we would have Chinese food take out Chinese food and watch a movie together. And we watched a variety of movies from typical kid flicks to biographies to other kinds of things, often that would depict relationships. And after the movie, we would talk about relationships. Maybe not that evening, because it might be too late for them and they're going to bed, but the next day I say, hey, the movie yesterday, this and this happened. What were you thinking about that? Or, you know, how, how did you think the characters were acting? Because it's a lot easier to talk about characters in a movie than to talk about them. Right? So when our kids were teenagers, we watched a movie called Juno. Have you seen this movie? 
some of you have, some of you have. And the short recap is, young teenage girl um, chooses to have sex for the first time with a, a young teenage boy. Both are relatively shy. She's a little bit on the snarky side. Um, so she's kind of leading all of this. She ends up getting pregnant and then chooses to have the baby and wants to give it up for adoption. And there are all kinds of complications. Great movie. I loved watching this with my teenagers and then talking through the choices that were made. Why did she make those choices? Why did he make those choices? What courage did it take? What fear was there? What was the role of the parents? All of those things. Powerful stuff, right? Scary movie. You watch this movie and then think about, oh my God, I'm not going to watch this with my kids. No, because it brings up a lot of questions. Questions you're not prepared for. <laughs> Um, and that's okay because that's the kind you want to have. And I'd rather have that over a movie than over the real life of my child. So it's a both and. I created opportunities to do this. Um, they, they, you know, of course, I do this for a living and I did, what did I do? Seven or eight beach retreats for teenagers for our church through the years, one of which my, both of my children attended, well, which was a little awkward for them because their father was up there talking and both brother and sister were in the room. Um, it was interesting, but they've come to expect that from me um, and tolerated it pretty well. Uh, all right, where was I? Oh, I need to pay attention to time. Um, how do you talk about body image? Uh, making decisions. This is the most important part, and then I'm going to get to the decision or dangers of the modern age. Help your children make decisions. Help them recognize what is their value set, right? How do you do that? Number one, you're very clear about here's my value set. This is what I believe. This is the way I would like to live in the world. And then encourage them to talk about what they believe. Again, don't impose your beliefs live your beliefs, live your values, and they will follow you. When you impose it, they'll rebel. That's how that happens. So live it, but demonstrate it. Show how that works. And as you show how that works, they will want to live that too. Right? You know the old song, they will know we are Christians by our love, by our love, right? It's the whole thing. Live your life and they, they will follow. Um, but then help them make decisions. What decisions? Peanut butter and jelly or ham and cheese? You want an apple or an orange? You know, that's where it begins when they're two, three, four years old. You know, they're five or six and they're going to go in and be in ballet or they're going to be in soccer or they're going to be in football or basketball or whatever. Ask them, what would you like to be in? You need to play a sport. Which sport would you like? And then help them think through how they make that decision. How do they sort the pros and cons? How does it fit with who they are as a kid? But teach them to make decisions. Schools no longer do this. Schools are teaching to tests because our government has said they have to rate the teachers and so they have messed up how people learn because that's not how we learn. We don't learn to a test. We learn to our interests. We learn to our fascination. Right? The more fascinating it is, the more likely we are to do it. Again with you, make this fascinating. How do you decide from inside of you about all of these things? Your children's life is their own. If they learn the personal responsibility for living it, for crafting their life when they're little, through their teenage years, into adulthood, they will live a life worth celebrating. But that comes from taking personal responsibility for each of the choices they make along the way. So, dangers of the modern world. Right, internet access. This did not exist 27 years ago. So believe it or not, it was just 27 years ago that the internet came into being. Back when there were hot metal pages, right? HTML, and a page had you know just words on it, no interactive clicking. <laughs> maybe a little hypertext when it got advanced, just 27 years ago. Your kids have now grown up with this thing. This is where they get their information. Children go to Google instantly, Wikipedia instantly to find information. YouTube, too fast. <laughs> Tumblr, too fast. Pornography is rampant. There is more pornography on the internet than anything else. And your children will get access to it either directly or indirectly through their peers. 
So trying to fight the fight of you know, my kids will never see this, they'll never look at that, that's not a winning battle. A winning battle is when that happens, them choosing to say, I don't need this and walk away from it. That's a winning battle. Trying to block it all from them, it's a flood. You know, the sewers have broken and it has just poured through the internet. And that's just the way it is. What does it do? Well, it does, it does bad things because kids think that is sexuality because they're not talking about it anywhere else. Um, they think that sex really has nothing to do with uh, a relationship with someone. It has to do with stimulation to orgasm. And worse, that it's only for the stimulation of orgasm for men and that women are this, just there along for the ride. And ultimately that women get humiliated and, and harmed and abused and like it. These are all the messages that come out of porn. Sorry. So what you're trying to do is make your, give your children the armor that says, when they see this, I don't need this. That's really your best bet. How do you do that? By demonstrating what love really is and how much more fulfilling it is when it's with a real person out of a real relationship where you see honor and respect in one another's eyes. How do you do that? Number one, by modeling it for them with your partner. And if your marriage is in distress, get help. The best gift you can give to your children is a strong marriage, right? If you had an injury or a pain somewhere else in your body, you would go see someone about it. If you have an injury or a pain in your marriage, go see somebody about it. Go see your pastor, they'll help you. you know, come see me if you need to, or ask me and I'll give you a referral to someone else. But take care of that. That's your number one defense. What they see in the relationship between you and your spouse, they will mimic in their lives, okay? Be aware of their friends and social circles. Who are those friends? How are they? One of my best defenses for that was I made sure all the friends came to our house, right? We had a house full of kids all the time. Lots of teens in our house. I actually, we have more children than just the two we biologically created um, who still come with us to the beach. <laughs> um, okay, self-esteem and self-respect. Really helping your child love themselves by demonstrating how much you love them. Respect themselves by how they treat their body, how they take care of themselves, how they take care of their clothing, how they set their image in the world. These things are the armor that help them move through the world well and, and deal with sensuality and sexuality well and relationships um, and be ready for dating. So we have about 10 minutes for questions. Yes, sir. Can you come up to the mic, please? I will repeat it, but I would thank you. Our, our kids watch mostly Scooby-Doo. They're seven and nine. There will be a time when they start to watch things with, for lack of a better term, Kardashian-like uh, representations of uh, relationships. And how do you prepare them and explain to them and help them realize that's not realistic or healthy, that kind of thing. And how does it relate to also the armoring against the the flood of porn, that kind of thing. So are there similarities or just similar kind of <coughs> things to do there? Okay, when was the last time you watched Scooby-Doo with them? Uh... Well, it's not Scooby-Doo now, it's Phineas and Ferb, but it's, okay. it's, it's yes. way down there. It's way down there. So Scooby-Doo, just picking on that one, because I, I don't know Phineas and Ferb, but I do know Scooby-Doo, right? Think of the way Velma is drawn, right? So she is Kardashian in her way. Not the big tush, but she has big breasts, right? How is Daphne? Daphne is <laughs> the blonde. Daphne is the blonde, right? Velma is the one with the glasses? Yeah. Velma has big breasts. You just oh. haven't noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Daphne, Daphne the blonde, okay. Daphne the blonde is drawn as a typical, typical beautiful blonde girl. So is the the guy who's dumb, right? Dumb, strong, that kind of stuff. Um, but there's a lot of sexuality actually drawn in the cartoons, and there always has been. Gilligan's Island, perhaps. Maybe that's too old for this crowd. Um, no? Gilligan's Island? You remember Gilligan's Island? Think of all the sexuality that was in there. It's, it's rampant in a lot of things. Your kids just don't know that it's there, right? Okay. So how do you prepare them for that? Number one, 
Um, preparing for porn actually has to do with values, values-based choices, right? So what do we value in the world? How do we respect our bodies? How do we respect the bodies of others? How do we look at people not as sexual objects, but as human beings first? So how do you do that? You demonstrate that by talking about the things that you watch. So what was the plot in the last Phineas and Ferb thing? Or what was the plot in... Um, uh, Inside Out is the last um, Pixar movie that I saw. But what was the plot? What was the nature of the relationships? That's actually one of the best movies out there in terms of emotions and that kind of stuff. Um, go back before that, what was that, Frozen? Frozen? What was the nature of the relationships there? That, that's a great story to talk about, acceptance and rejection. So the one daughter was different. She had magic, the ice magic, and she got rejected. You can't be who you are, right? I can't help you discover that and learn how to manage it well. I just have to reject it and put it in a box and separate you from your sister. And the younger sister going, I don't really get this. Why, am I, why do I not get to interact with my sister that I got to interact with before? Great things to talk about. But now you're talking about movies and songs and that kind of stuff. Keep up with their music, what they're listening to, and get them to talk about what does that theme mean to you? Why does it resonate with your life now? Right? So if you do that, your kids were six and nine? Seven and nine, I was close. <laughs> Seven and nine. Um, if you do that now, if you talk about their music with them now, if you talk about their stories with them now, like what books are they reading? And what do those relationships mean? Harry Potter was a great set of books to read because it had all kinds of things about relationships in there and acceptance and rejection and being part of a group and out of a group. Um, and parenting and losing a parent and a bunch of different things uh, that you can talk about. When you have those conversations, then shifting over to talking about their life, their relationship, their sexuality becomes easier because they're used to talking to you about it in terms of dissecting characters and understanding relationships. Does that make sense? Yeah. To ask them what they got out of it, what, what did they see happening? Was that a good choice, mm -hmm. bad choice. Or how would they rate that choice? So even before good and bad, w you know, would it work for you? Is that a choice you would make? If so, why? If not, why not? And sharing with them. You know, for me, I didn't, I, I would not have chosen that way. For me, I value da 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 da, and so I would have chosen in this direction as an offering, not as a directive, but as a confiding, a sharing with faith of my child about who I am and what I do. Not an imposition that it's, it's intended that you do this too. Okay, other questions? <laughs> Thank you. I didn't know if that was a question or five minutes. I had a, a follow on, man. Okay. That's okay. If nobody else has Go ahead. Well, I was just trying to think about what makes these choices bad in these unrealistic portrayals of relationships. Like, uh, you see, on even on what's normally thought to be G or PG TV, the, the, the way relationships are portrayed, um, think about soap operas. It's just what, what is hidden are the negative cons consequences of the choices these people make. Mm -hmm. It's all kind of rosy. The, the realistic <coughs> outcomes of a lot of the choices are bad. Mm -hmm. and they're just hidden from, hidden from sight or, or somehow magically dealt with. Is that kind of how you talk with your kids about it? Like sure. You play through that and say, what really what happened here? Mm -hmm. Kind of how you do it? Sure. Yeah, and I might ask them, what do you imagine happens after that? You know, what do you think happened after? And if they don't have an answer, they say, well, you know, I think this might have happened. You know, so, for instance, um, in Juno, again, if you haven't seen Juno, I would strongly recommend it. It's a, it's a great movie, great dialogue. Um, really funny in a kind of dark humor way um, and the main actress in it I can't remember what her name is but she, Ellen Page, yeah. Ellen Page? Uh -huh. yes she just does a wonderful job conveying all of the emotions that go along with this particular situation and, and the, this is one of the places where all the concept well not all the consequences but many of the consequences were considered including abortion and, and avoiding abortion um, so there was the opportunity to go to an abortion clinic. She looked at all of that. She looked at the shaming that happened uh, there and also re-questioned herself about what is this life that's inside of me and, and how does that work. Powerful, powerful thing. So that's a place where it wasn't glossed over, but in the places where it is, 
bring it up and talk about here's what I think might have happened and let your kids struggle with it. So you're tying choices and consequences. All the time, right? Because that's what life really is, right? We all have to make choices. We make the choice and then we have a consequence. Consequences are not bad. Consequences are just what happens after a choice. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. Some of them happen immediately. Some of them happen in the long term. And when kids begin to understand that, they become powerfully armored for living in the world because they know that the choice is theirs and that they can even make a bad choice and recover from it. One of my favorite stories from the Bible you know, is a woman who's about to be stoned. And Jesus ends up saying to her, do you know that you sinned? And she says, yes. And he said, then sin no more. Learn from this, go live a different life. Wow, wow. Kids, you can make a mistake and recover from it. <laughs> it's not the end of the world. And so many kids, I don't think there's a new TV show out, so the internet ruined my life. Have you seen this show? So this is about kids who sometimes are now adults who made a bad mistake, they had a, they sent a sexting message and it got you know all over the internet or whatever, or they got bullied on the line or that kind of stuff. And way too many children are overwhelmed by that and say my life is now over and so they kill themselves. And the kids who recover from that, who recognize, yep, that was a mistake, it hurt me, and I am still here. I can still live a good life. That's the resilience you want. Yes, sir. Um, so number one, it has to do with what is affection, what is relationship, right? Um, what are you feeling in your body? Being able to name body parts. So your seven-year-old, seven-year-old, being able to talk freely about their body, and they're starting to have changes. So seven to ten years old, they're starting to have uh, the change in their hormones. Um, they'll see secondary sex characteristics like um, under our underarm, not under hair arms, that's good, underarm hair, <laughs> um, pubic hair, that kind of things. They may be having spontaneous erections. Children have erections from birth, you know, um, or men, uh, male children have erections from birth. Uh, but they may be having more spontaneous erections and be wondering what is all of this about. Um, Self-play is really common in boys and girls from roughly age six, seven, all the way through the rest of their lives. Uh, so helping to normalize that and talk about where is that appropriate and where not. So often what happens is your kid is watching television someplace or playing a game. And you walk in the room and you see that their hand is down their pants. This is not an uncommon occurrence, right? They're actively doing something else and their hand is in their pants. <laughs> right? I'm, I, if you haven't seen it, it does happen. You just may not have walked in on it. And then talking about, you know, when's the appropriate place to do that? How does that work? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? I will tell you that asking questions and talking, listening first, gets you a better long-term outcome. Because when you can make it safe enough that they can answer your questions, then it's safe enough for them to initiate conversations. When your kid goes, I don't know, really quickly, it's because they're afraid of what you'll do next. Not that you've ever done anything, because their assumption is you're going to do something. Right? You didn't tell me I could do this, so, and you're asking me about it, so it must mean that I can't. That's what happens in your kid's brain which is why they respond that way. But if you can make it safe enough for them to answer your questions, it will be safe enough for them to initiate the conversations. So that's one of your gauges, that's another tactical thing. Um, and then talk about, again, the, the third party things. Read books with your kids and talk about the book. So one of the things that happens with a lot of my parents is they've read a book with their kid, they feel really good because I've helped their education, but they haven't done the next step that would help them as parents, which is learn to converse with the kid. And that's the best opportunity, because it's so low threat. It's this outside thing you're talking about, but that represents any concept you want. So you can get a book that you read with your kid that talks about sex, 
directly or indirectly, and it'll open the conversation for you because you can talk about the characters. Yeah, I love it. Okay, I'm out of time.